Hello and good afternoon. My name is Nathan Barwell. I'm one of the category managers here at the Seaward Group. Uh, today we're going to be introducing you to the HIPOT test, one of the core tests performed throughout a kind of product's life cycle, particularly with a, an angle towards production line testing. Now, just before we start the presentation, um, I'd just like to draw your attention to the go to uh, utility that you would have installed to join the, the meeting today. You'll notice there's a function there for asking questions. So please, if you do have any questions that you'd like to ask throughout the presentation, please feel free to, to add them. All of those questions will get logged at, at my end. Uh, and towards the end of the presentation, we'll have space where if you do have any questions, I'll, I'll look to answer those. If I don't have the answers today, I'll, I'll certainly come back to you. So please feel free to use those. Also, if you do have any suggestions for future com content you would like us to, to cover, please, again, feel free to uh, to send those through on the questions and we can we can look at how we can deal with those in the future. So let's start talking about the, the HIPOT test. Let's discuss what we're going to go through today. Firstly, we're going to discuss what the HIPOT test is. We'll talk about some of the definitions and the terminologies that I'll use throughout the, uh, the presentation today. We'll talk about why we perform the test, what we're testing during the test. We'll have a look at some typical kind of failure reasons, and then we'll discuss actually performing the test. So how do we make connections? What are the different test parameters we should use? We'll finish this up by having a look at some of the test standards so we can get a feel for the various different test standards dependent upon what you're manufacturing, what the kind of recommendations are there in terms of the voltages, et cetera, that we, we should be testing at. We've then got a couple of video demonstrations just to show you some of the tests being performed uh, in, the, in the real world, so to speak. Uh, and then finally, we'll give you a brief introduction to our HAL series of testers, and then we'll floor the, throw the floor open and we'll, we'll look to answer any of the questions that you, you may have sent through. So let's, let's start with, with some of these common definitions. So the official name for a HIPOT test is actually a dielectric test. Um, and the one we're going to focus on today is, is the dielectric withstand test. And I will discuss the differences um, in, between the dielectric withstand test and another test in a, in a little bit of detail um, throughout the presentation. So just to give it some of its more common names, we often refer to it as a HIPOT test. The HIPOT test is quite traditionally an American uh, terminology, but it essentially derives from the term high potential or high voltage. So essentially we're calling it a high voltage test. In the UK, it's common that we call it a flash tester um, or a flash test if we're performing the test. And that essentially is derived from a failure condition known as a flashover. Uh, a flashover being an arc of current where the, uh, the current conducts from one point to another. Uh, that flashover is deemed as a failure condition, hence why we call it a, a flash test. And the other more common um, name that you'll hear for this test is often an electric strength test. In certain standards, it's referred to as, as this electric strength. And essentially, that's just basically down to this test being a gauge of the electrical strength of the insulation. So for those of you that may not know, when I do talk about insulation, I'm essentially talking about any potential barrier between current carrying conductors and parts we potentially could touch and therefore cause a shock hazard. So insulation is there to ultimately prevent uh, a shock hazard um, from, from the user or, or the operator. You'll hear me talk about today breakdown. Now breakdown is essentially the point at which the electrical insulation fails. So we apply a voltage. If the insulation is not strong enough to handle that voltage, the electrical insulation will fail. That allows current to flow and therefore we get what we call a breakdown. Now that current flow is referred to as leakage current. So the leakage current is the amount of current that's flowing away through the insulation uh, into the return terminal of the tester during the, um, during the test. Too much leakage current will often revolt, result in what we call a trip current. So the trip current is essentially our pass fail threshold. So as the current is, is flowing, if it gets to a point where it's too much, now that could be a user defined level or it could be a hardware defined, i.e. The, the amount of current that the tester is possible or capable of generating, then we get into what we call a trip current. So a trip current is the maximum amount of current that will flow before a failure is, is, is defined. Now, there's two genuine or general setups that we can have for a trip current. One is what we call our um, soft trip, which effectively is the user defined trip level. So we decide that we will only allow five milliamps of leakage. That's often referred to as a soft trip current. 
And then we have what we call a hard trip current. And that hard trip current is essentially the maximum capabilities of the tester. Now that is usually defined by the amount of the, uh, of the VA capabilities of the transformer within the test equipment. So if it's too much for that, the tester will halt the test. And typically this trip current will Im invoke an instant um, failure condition and an instant disconnection of um, the test output. Whether that's a soft or a hard trip current, then that should instantly stop the test and instantly uh, stop any output of voltage. So we've now got our common definitions. Let's talk about why we perform the test. Well, the number one, the ultimate reason for doing it is we want to ensure the product is safe to be used. The point of a safety test is to make sure the product is safe, and that's why we do the high pot test. By doing that test, we can also therefore demonstrate compliance with regional and international standards, as well as our kind of legal requirements in terms of directives. So things like the low voltage directive, we can demonstrate our compliance with that by following a standard that recommends a high pot test. A lesser used function of the, the high pot test, but it can be used to uh, aid in quality control. Um, if we think about any product that we manufacture, let's assume we're manufacturing product A. Product A is designed in one way. It's built in exactly the same way, using exactly the same components every time it's, it's manufactured. Now, in theory, if everything stays the same, we should always expect the reading to be the same. So we can use the values determined by the leakage current to determine whether we've got any fluctuation on the, uh, the quality of the product. If for any reason those values start to drift, that could be an indicator to us that something has changed within the product. It could be something like a supply issue. So we can use the high pot test potentially as a measure of quality uh, as well as uh, ultimately safety. And finally, we can also use it as a measure of degradation. So if we are using the high pot test in one of its applications, which would be a routine, uh, kind of ongoing test for to repair the product or after use, we can start to log and record the leakage currents. And as they start to creep up, we know that something's going wrong. We can decide to do something about it as part of our maintenance schedule before it becomes an unsafe uh, piece of equipment. So when do we typically perform high pot testing? Well, if we consider any kind of product throughout its life cycle, there's generally going to be three key times that it might go through a high pot test. Um, certainly two where it will and one dependent on the application where it might. So the first one is, is what we call our type testing phase. So at this point, we've decided we're going to manufacture a product. We've taken it through its R&D phase. We've got now kind of prototypes. We need to make sure that prototype is safe to go onto the market uh, for sale. So at this stage, we're doing a test uh, as part of our compliance documentation to ensure the product is safe to go into uh, into go into sale. Now, this test is often the most rigorous of all the tests that we would perform on it. Typically, it may be at higher voltages. It definitely will almost be at longer periods of time just to really stress the product to make sure the design is sound and, and safe. But once we've done that, we can then put the product into production. And that's where our second phase of testing comes into play. So at this point, this is performed on pretty much every product we, we manufacture. In fact, most standards will require that 100% of test of every product that comes off the production line is tested. And essentially what we're doing is trying to prove that the product has been built and is safe in accordance with the design phase. So we know it's safe by design. We just need to make sure that the actual act of building it hasn't contributed to any electrical safety issues. And the final one is after we've serviced, maintained or repaired it. So we again, we're potentially re performing a repeat of the manufacturer's test to ensure ongoing safety of the product. So the term high pot is typically used quite generally across any kind of high voltage test. But there are two types of tests that are, are more applicable to, to being known as a high pot test. The first one is our dielectric breakdown test. Now, this one typically isn't performed on production lines, um, and we'll, we'll cover why that is. Um, and the one we're going to talk about mostly today is the dielectric withstand test. But to talk about the breakdown test, essentially what this is, is, is a measure of how good the insulation is. And the way we measure this is by essentially starting the voltage at zero and increasing it until the point of breakdown or until the point the insulation gives way and allows too much current to flow. So you can see by doing that, it, it is destructive. 
we are essentially creating a failure condition within the product. And that's why we would never use this on kind of a production line. We don't want to have the product in a less safe state than it was at the um, at the point it was built. So typically, the dielectric breakdown test is performed in kind of laboratory conditions or as part of the R&D, where we only really want to understand exactly where the full breakdown point is. The more common test, the one that we'll talk about today, is the, um, the dielectric withstand test. So for that test, we essentially apply a known voltage to a product for a period of time. That then means we can monitor any leakage current to ensure it's below a set point. Now that point is typically our trip current. We want to make sure our current is low enough that it's not causing an issue. This test is performed both in the R&D or the design phase as part of the type test and also in the kind of production and in the kind of repair world as well. So it's, it's the one that's most versatile, most often used. And again, it's typically non-destructive, uh, particularly in the kind of production and repair environments where, where we're stressing it a bit less than kind of the type test. It, it's, it's a non-destructive. The only time it can cause problems, if there is an underlying condition that causes a failure, that failure could, could then be damaged uh, at the point of performing the test. If you do want more information between the two of these tests, we do have an article. We will send out a thank you email to everyone that attends today. Uh, there will be some links on there to kind of more, more uh, useful reading. And we do have an article that, that discusses the difference between kind of dielectric breakdown and dielectric withstand with some videos. So we'll get that out to you to, to, to understand a bit later. So let's talk about what is tested. And we've already really answered this question, but just to elaborate a little bit more, to protect the user from shock, a manufacturer can look to employ a number of safety features. The two key ones being either grounding, where we're fitting uh, an external path to ground so that any fault current will flow nicely away to earth, keeping us safe, or they can add insulation. And that insulation acts as a barrier between the live parts and the parts we can touch as a, as a user or an operator. And this is essentially where the high pot test comes in. We're effectively stressing the, the insulation. So let's go ahead and start talking about what we're actually doing. So as we said, to, perf to do a high pot test is to perform a stress test on the insulation of the product above that of normal use. So typically when we're performing this test, the voltages we use are much greater than those of the operating voltage of the product. It's used to detect any breakdown in the insulation properties of the item under test. So again, we're looking to make sure there's no path in an ideal world between the current carrying conductors and parts we can touch that would pose a safety hazard to, a, to an end user. So any failures that we do pick up could be indicative of problems with the design. It could be the manufacturing process itself. It could be that we've supplied incorrect uh, components to the product. Uh, we've received faulty components from our supplier or if we're doing kind of regular testing, it can also highlight where wear and tear on the product has, has kind of taken over and potentially caused damage. So let's have a look at the kind of typical test failures we might see while, while performing a test. Obviously the most simple one that we'd pick up would be direct shorts between any of the line conductors, live and neutral, and the chassis or the earth cable. It can highlight where we have poor spacing between conductors or current carrying parts. So anything where our creepage or clearance distances have been made too small, i.e. there should be set gaps between products that carry mains. If for any reason they've been reduced, now that could be part of the manufacturing process. Someone could have over tightened something and bent a pin, for example, and it's got too close to an exposed part, we could create an issue. The aim of the high pot is to pick up those kind of issues. Obviously, it will pick up things like exposed wires, crushed or pinched or split insulation, where they're, they're too close to one another. It can also identify, as we said, supply issues. So there could be tiny pinholes in the insulation of the cables we've bought. Uh, we could have been supplied incorrectly rated components. Again, the high pot test could potentially pick up these, these faults. And for those of you doing kind of testing as part of an ongoing kind of uh, maintenance schedule, particularly in kind of the power tool world, you could get a buildup of conductive materials inside the product. Again, the high pot test will pick that up uh, and, and issue that as a failure if they become too close to the, uh, to the conductors. 
Okay, so before we go any further, let's have a quick conversation about the precautions you should consider before and during the high pot test. So first and foremost, it's imperative that we do not touch the item under test or the test leads whilst the actual test output is live. Again, this massively reduces our shock hazard. If we're not in contact with the product, we, we cannot be, uh, be capable of getting an electric shock. Your test lead should be suitably rated for the test voltage and current that you're going to be supplying um, during the testing. Again, it's worth ensuring that your test leads are inspected regularly just to make sure there are no, no damage to the cables. And also the end in which the operator comes into contact, i.e. the probe or the clip end, should be suitably protective to ensure they cannot slip. So it should employ things such as finger guards, insulation over the, um, the actual teeth on a, on a clip, or something like a hand guard on the probe to stop the operator being able to slip down and come into contact with the, uh, the item under test. If we look at the wider area, we should ensure that the actual test area itself where the, the uh, electrical testing is going to be performed is suitably isolated. Now there are a number of ways you can look to make a safe uh, isolated area. One is to employ a test enclosure, in which case the item is placed inside, an interlock door is shut, and everything happens within the uh, the enclosure. If that's not practical, there are ways where you can suitably isolate the whole environment to ensure that if the operator was to come into contact with the product under worse conditions, the whole area is isolated from ground, so the shock hazard should be removed. So this is all in line with a, a European standard, EN50191. Uh, it's regularly available. We have a guide uh, to this, this particular standard. Again, when we send out the thank you email, we'll ensure there's a link for you to be able to download this and, and have a read up and, and ensure you can create a safe working environment for your test operators. And then finally, we should always ensure switches are engaged where they're present. So if you do have a, a kind of on off switch on your, your product during the testing phase, it should be in the on position to make sure that the entire circuit is engaged and tested accordingly. If for any reason we had the switch in the off position, part of that circuit might only be tested up to the uh, up to the switch point and we want to make sure we get beyond that and into the product. So if you do have a physical on off switch on your device, always make sure it's in the on position prior to testing. So hopefully up to this point now, you'll be comfortable knowing exactly what a high bot test is, but let's now go on and talk about actually performing the test. And, and the first thing we're going to start with is actually making test connections. Now, the high pot test typically will consist of two connections to the item that we're testing, essentially a positive end and a negative end. So the positive end is usually made to the main voltage carrying conductors of the item under test. So typically we apply this to the live and neutral conductors. And then we also have our negative or return end, which generally will then be applied to either the earth return, as in the earth cable, or to the chassis of the item under test. Essentially, we're just testing between two points. So we could do a point-to-point -point test where one end of the, the probe, the high end, is on one end, the low end is on the other end, and separated by some insulation. And we want to make sure that insulation is good. Essentially, this whole test is a point-to-point -point test, uh, but typically on products, it's performed across the, uh, the mains carrying con conductors. Now, it's typical that where you do have kind of mains carrying conductors, particularly kind of multiple, like live neutral, or even on a three-phase system, you've got multiple um, lives, it's normal that we strap those conductors together and then we apply the voltage to all of the shorty conductors and then use the return on either, like I said, the chassis or the, uh, the earth cable. So let's have a look at that in, in real world terms. On the left hand side, we have our high pot tester. You notice down at the bottom of the, the tester, we have two ports there. We have a positive and a negative. And then we also have our item under test, which very simply in this diagram consists of a live conductor and a neutral conductor across a load. And then we also have our, our item chassis. So what we would typically do in this scenario is firstly link our live and neutrals together. From that point, we would then apply our high pot output clip to the live and neutral shorted conductors. And then we simply apply the probe or clip to the exposed conductive points on the, uh, the item chassis. So as a very simple definition, that's how a high pot test is performed. But let's now have a look at how we do it specifically for class one and class two products. 
So as we know, class one products are defined as being products that have an earth for safety. So in that case, we can actually use the earth uh, terminal or the earth pin of the plug as the return terminal into the instrument rather than the equipment chassis itself. So essentially the earth connection acts as the return path for any leakage current. Now with that comes an important caveat. If we are gonna be performing the test using the earth return as the return point, we need to make sure that we've always performed our earth bond test on all of the exposed metal parts prior to performing the high part test. What we don't want to come into a situation is where we haven't tested the earth conduction path and for any reason that isn't connected because someone's forgot to connect it and therefore actually what we're doing is not providing a return to the uh, the test instrument and therefore we've created a situation where we may get false passes we need to make sure that any earth bond test points have been tested we know that they're then connected to the mains earth out of the product and therefore we know that when we do the high pot test we have a good sound connection method so our diagram would look exactly like this Again, we'd strap our live and neutral conductors together and we would apply our return clip to the ground conductor or the earth cable as, it, as it's known. Now for double insulated products, that's slightly different. We don't have uh, an earth cable to act as a return. So we need to physically supply a return path from the product under test to the tester. And that's typically done by means of a probe or a, a clip. Now, because we don't have the earth, there may be multiple exposed points that are all separated and we would potentially need to test all of those individually. So that's either being done by manually moving a probe from point to point, or if we wanted a more automated route, we could do things like wrap the product in metal foil. We could use things like conductive, metal, uh, conductive foam nests that the product sits in, making sure that all points that need to be tested are in contact with the conductive foam. Or we could make something like an automated jig where there are literally metal pins touching all of the points at which we need to test. In which case we can bring them back to one common point and therefore we'd only need to perform the test once. So it depends on your, your makeup and the way your production line set up. But multiple points uh, on a class 2 product will requ require multiple test connections. So what about if your connections are being made and your product itself has a has a plug? Um, the easiest way to do that is to actually use a, a test outlet box. This makes all of the connections nice and simple for the operators and also safe for the operators. They're not having to necessarily mess around with clips and probes. Uh, for a class one product, like we can see in the box here, we simply make the connections by using um, the black terminal which is strapped the live and neutral together. Now in this case, it's it's a simple hard strap. So we just have a, a high voltage cable that runs between the two. And then the green uh, probe acts as the return. So we plug that back in. That's connected to the earth pin of the socket on the outlet box. So the operator simply in this case for a class one, plugs the product in, all the connections are made without any exposed um, probes or clips, making it nice and safe for the operator. We also have ones that do have a return for a class two. So again, we can plug it in, but we have a return, whether that is again to a probe, uh, the probes are all safe for use. But using an outlet box where you do have a plug and socket combination makes for much um, faster and safer test connections. Okay, so now we understand how we make the connections, let's talk about the different parameters that we need to consider when performing a high pot test. Essentially, there are three key uh, parameters that we need to think about. The first one is the output. What are we going to apply to the product? How long are we going to apply the output to the product? And finally, what pass limits are we going to apply to ensure a good test? So let's start with the output connection or the output characteristic, the test voltage itself. So normally we'd recommend that this is defined by the manufacturing standard. We'll, we'll talk to you again a little bit later on uh, in the presentation and we'll show you some of the recommendations uh, within a few manufacturing standards. But as a first port of call, that's always where we would recommend you, you look. However, if you're not sure or potentially if no product standard exists for the, uh, the product that you're manufacturing, the, the general kind of classic rule of thumb for, for um, high pot testing and the voltage that you should apply to it, uh, in this case for a class one product or an earth product, would be as follows. We'd simply take the working voltage of the equipment, multiply that by two, and then add a thousand volts. 
So if we use the example of a, a UK 240 volt AC supply, then we'd multiply that by two, would give us 480 volts, add our 1,000 volts, which would give us an overall test voltage of 1,480 volts. Now, this kind of coincides with many of the test standard recommendations. We'll show you that a little bit later. Uh, in this particular case, if we use the example 60958, the lighting standard, the recommendation there is a 1500 volt uh, test. And again, that's that's replicated through a, through a number of um, particular manufacturing standards. So what about a double insulated or a class two product? Well, in that case, the voltage is generally recommended that it's tested even higher than that. And that generally coincides with the fact that we have two layers of insulation. So we're gonna stress the two layers of insulation with effectively two amounts of voltage. So we double the voltage for double the insulation is a good rule of thumb. So using our previous example for class two product, 1480 volts times two, 2960 volts, or near as close to 3000 volts would be our, uh, our test voltage. And again, you'll see this replicated across a number of standards. So what about test times? Again, as per most of the advice within this uh, setting of parameters, your first port of call should always be to refer to your, your standard for the test times recommended. Um, the other thing to consider is if you do need to add any kind of ramping uh, prior to the test, that cannot be uh, eaten into the total hold test time. So you have ramp times and you have hold times, and those are two separate things. So your total test time should consist of hold time plus ramp times that you add. Your hold time is the important one because the product should withstand for the period stated within the uh, test standard. So if you do add ramping, that needs to be in addition to the hold time within the uh, within the test standard. Now, in terms of time, kind of typical test times, for those of you that are involved in the type testing world, the, the pre kind of production testing, the typical test time for that is generally quite elongated. It's much longer than say a production test. Um, so we tend to be looking at kind of a minimum 60 seconds, in some instances up to kind of two minutes long. In production or, or maintenance testing, we have to balance the, the throughput with the, um, with the requirement for actually performing a sound test. So typically what you find in, in the production environment is it's normally in a region of kind of one to, to five seconds. Now some standards actually apply another rule of thumb that if you're going to be testing it at one second, you actually increase the voltage somewhat over what you would have done it for 60 seconds in the type test. But again, please refer to your standard to uh, to be sure of those those kind of levels of, of test times. And then the last one, the, the importance for defining whether it's pass or fail is setting where we want our limits to be or our trip current, as we uh, as we call it. So again, what we're stating here is that our pass limits are where we deem to be a failure point. Uh, when performing the test. So how much current will we allow to flow before we define that the um, the test is a failure? Again, typically test standards will make recommendations or, or statements regarding the pass-fail threshold. Um, five milliamps is a fairly typical value and that's repeated in a number of um, BS standards including 60598 for the lighting, 60335 for uh, household type equipment, they all recommend a five milliamps um, pass limit. Some standards will also mention a phrase such as no breakdown or flashover shall occur. Now this would generally, if we were watching this in a, in a graphical terms, would be a very sudden and sharp increase in the current flow. But bearing in mind that we're typically going to be using operators to perform this, having them monitor the current isn't always uh, a suitable kind of way to do this. So that's where we apply our trip limits. So what we would do is apply a trip limit where if the current for any reason exceeds that value, then we would uh, we would deem that to be a failure. So how do we know where to set the pass limit, especially where we have um, statements such as no breakdown or flashover shall occur? Well, one answer to that is we just let the tester reach its maximum amount of current and then it will halt the test anyway. However, we have to consider the safety aspects of doing that. Some of the high pot testers on the market can deliver a large amount of current and that large amount of current could be uh, extremely hazardous to anyone if they were to be exposed to, to it. So what we can do is apply a bit of a common sense approach to it. Now, our, our recommendation is, is as such. What we suggest you do is take a number of known good products and perform the high pot test on them 
for the length of time and the voltage stipulated within your, your testing standard. Keep a, keep a record of all of those measured currents until you get to a, a decent amount, you know, maybe 10, 10 results. From there, you should be able to work out what your average current flow is based on those measured values. And then once you've got that value, that should give you a baseline reading for what you would expect the leakage current to be on every good product going forward from this point. Now, what we don't want to do is set that limit too close to that value. So from there, you could maybe add a, a factor of higher, so maybe 25%, 30% higher than the, the average value. And that should keep you in line with then any kind of slight variation between, between your pass limits. So uh, as an example here, we've measured a number of products. Our average measured value is 3.3 milliamps. We then add 25% to that, which will give us 0.825 milliamps. Add the two together, and in this instance, we'd recommend applying a, a limit of 4.125 milliamps. So use this approach if for any reason your standard states something like no breakdown should occur, and we don't want the operators necessarily making the decision about where, where breakdown occurs. If we use this kind of rule of thumb, we can apply a pretty sensible um, pass limit to the, uh, to the products under test. What about a lower limit? Well, some HIPOT testers, including all of the, the seaward ones, allow you to set a lower limit when performing the HIPOT test. But, but what use is that in, in terms of safety? Well, in many ways, it's not necessarily a safety function, but it is a good way of ensuring you have um, some definite connection um, to the product under test. So what is the point of a lower limit? Well, when we do the HIPOT test, it's typical we will see some leakage. Uh, particularly when you're doing AC testing, for, for reasons we'll come on to in a moment with regards to uh, capacitance. But if we know we're getting some leakage, then we shouldn't be getting zero leakage. And what we can do is set a limit that's beneath your kind of expected pass limit, but higher than zero and certainly lower than kind of your average values. And what that does is it allows you to be sure that you've definitely got connections. So if we take the example that we know something's got some leakage, if for a reason the operator didn't put the probes in the right place, we'd expect to get potentially zero leakage, in which case the tester would pick this up as a failure, and it's really a, a note back to, from quality that potentially something hasn't been done correctly during the test. So it helps you ensure that the test is, uh, is performed correctly. Now, for those of you where we talk about DC testing, uh, that, that can be quite difficult um, for reasons we'll go into where capacitance isn't potentially an issue and you've got no leakage on the product. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a little while. But lower limits, again, can be very useful. As I said, with the, um, the difference between breakdown and withstand testing, we do have a, uh, a document dedicated to talking about applying and setting test limits. Again, we'll make sure that's linked within the, uh, the thank you email when we send those out at the end of uh, the presentation. So what about AC or DC high pot testing? Um, most modern testers will allow you to set an AC or a DC high pot tester. Um, and really, the decision is which one should we, we use? Now, firstly, when you come into looking at your standard, it's typical that the defined voltages are typically those for an AC test. Um, so you will notice it will say AC 1500 volts, for example. But there's often a note that allows you to perform DC um, testing. And there's a good example of, uh, of a statement such as this from a, a standard. So it will say something along the lines, instead of being subjected to an AC voltage, the insulation may be subjected to a DC voltage of 1.414 times the voltage shown in the table. Now, there's no clear definition in the standards that you should always perform an AC or you should always perform a DC. So really the decision is, is up to you as to, to why you, which method you want to use. Um, it is kind of more typical that you would go on the main supply. So for example, if your product is supplied from an AC source, you typically would perform it on an AC. And if it's powered from DC source, then typically again, we'd perform a, a DC test on it. But it isn't exclusively uh, that that is the case. You can choose to do AC or DC. And the reasons that you may choose one or the other, we'll, we'll go into at this point. So firstly, let's have a look at the, the magnitude of test voltage. If you're going to decide to do AC or DC, you need to decide at what level of voltage you're going to be performing it. Now, DC voltage um, must stress the insulation as much as the peak value of the AC test. So for those of you that aren't necessarily familiar with this, 
if we take a 1000 volt uh, AC signal, it will actually have a peak of 1414 volts. So in order to ensure that we're stressing the product the same method, if we perform a DC test, we need to take that peak voltage into account. So typically the DC voltage will be set at the peak voltage uh, of, the, uh, of the AC waveform. Typically, and very simply, if we take the AC uh, prescribed value, multiply that by 1.414, it's often approximated to 1.5 in some standards, that would give us the, um, the appropriate DC voltage uh, under which to perform the test. So as an example, we're gonna do a 1500 volt test, What's our equivalent for DC? 1500 times 1.414 would give us a 2,121 volt peak. So we'd be looking to do a DC test at 2,121 volts. So one of the big decisions about whether or not to use an AC or DC test could be the amount of capacitance uh, present within your testing circuit. Now, capacitance is often overlooked as thought of as being the, the components within there. Do we have capacitors in there but capacitance will be naturally occurring across the entire product um, and it's there in anything from any cables um, sitting next to each other um, again components so if we consider what capacitance is a, a capacitor is essentially two conductors separated by an insulator so when we apply the voltage the difference voltage difference between the two conductors will result in what we call a reactive current flow across that capacitance and again, as I said, that capacitance could be naturally occurring in your cabling, in, in components you've got. So the reality of performing an AC test and not picking up some sort of reactive current flow is, is pretty small. It's going to be there. Now, the thing to consider in this instance is your reactive current flow and your actual leakage are going to be combined within this measurement. And we don't know which is which. So we have to ensure that our limits are taken into account both components here. So what does that actually mean? Well, firstly, the reactive current flow could be much greater than that of the actual leakage current. And we don't, again, as I said, we don't know and we can't separate the two. So we have to set our limits accordingly to take into account both the real leakage and the, uh, the kind of reactive leakage. So what could happen is if you have a particularly uh, capacitive type product, uh, things like inverters, for example, can be very tricky at this stage. We're going to push the current up because of the, um, the capacitance. Now, by pushing the current up, we're going to have to push our limit up for pass, which also then occurs into kind of operator safety. The higher the current we potentially could be exposing our operators to, the, the bigger the risk of harm. So for an AC test, reactive current will always be there. It's going to be a product of the, uh, the final result value. However, if we look at DC testing, it's slightly different. DC testing will only... Um, show any kind of current reactive current flow during the initial charging or the ramping phase. Once the product is fully charged, essentially the voltage stabilizes, there's no reactive current flow. So a DC test, once it's fully charged and, and, and testing correctly, will display the true leakage currents. So what that really means is if we have capacitive products, a DC test can actually allow you to apply much lower and safer test limits than, than that of the AC test. Next thing to consider is the kind of length of time that we perform the test. So with a DC test, typically a DC test takes much longer to, to, to perform than an AC test. Firstly, because in order to charge the circuit, we need to ramp the voltage. So that period of time to, to actually charge it up could take a number of seconds. Again, that, that is something to consider on the production line. But once it is charged, as we said, no reactive current flow leaves only the true leakage being measured. However, the, the, uh, the next kind of time frame and, and potential safety has, aspect for this is once we get to full charge on a DC product, we then need to consider discharging the product at the end of the test. What we don't want to happen is that the product stays charged, the operator comes along, touches the product, and that discharge then happens through the operator. So we also need to infor, ensure that the product is suitably discharged at the end of the test. Now, most modern testers will have a, a discharge path. In fact, in, in terms of 61010, it's now a requirement that for any high pot tester, it does have a discharge path, so it can discharge the, the product under test. But that will, again, add time to the, um, to the production line. And in certain circumstances, 
it could it could significantly increase the test time, both by adding a ramp at the start and a ramp at the end and a discharge. So DC testing typically will take longer, whereas AT testing, because it is constantly increasing and decreasing, i.e. the AC waveform, number one, we're creating a natural ramp of the test voltage. We don't charge the product because it's typically charging and discharging kind of 50 times a second. So at the end of the test, it it's, should be safe for the operator to, uh, to handle. Um, so typically an AC test is much quicker. The other thing to consider is, is polarity. Uh, again, from a time frame point of view, AC testing will test the, uh, the product under test, both in the positive to negative waveform, but also in the negative to positive side of the waveform. So we're actually testing an AC circuit in, in both polarities. However, DC testing, because of its very nature, will only um, perform the, the, the test in one polarity. Now, if you do need to test in both polarities, that could be overcome by simply swapping the test lead connections. So taking your hot end and swapping it for the cold end and, and vice versa. But again, we're adding kind of time into the, uh, into the test circuit. So hopefully you're starting to build up a picture of kind of when and where it, it may be significant to use either, uh, either type of test. So let's have a look at the AC testing and let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages. So from a positive point of view, from an AC test, test times are usually much shorter. There's no kind of need to discharge the device under test once you've completed the test and the insulation is stressed in, in both polarities. But as a disadvantage, you are measuring the total current, total leakage current. So both your product of your reactive current flow and the true leakage. So you have to bear in mind that the, the result might be higher than you potentially expected. And therefore you may have to add higher pass limits um, which ultimately could make it less safe for the operator if they were exposed to the uh, the test voltage. From a DC point of view, number one, you tend to get a better representation of the true leakage because the device is charged. There is no uh, reactive current flow. You're seeing generally true leakage, which then means that pass limits can be set at much lower values, even typically less than kind of one milliamp, um, keeping things nice and safe for the operators. If you do have a highly capacitive circuit, it might be the only way that you can perform a high pot test because the AC test is just going to see all of that reactive current flow and potentially evoke its, its hard current trip. The disadvantages with DC testing, they are slower to perform because you do need to consider uh, the kind of ramp times. It must de be discharged at the end of the test, which again could take time in the production line. And as we said, we're only stressing the insulation in one polarity. And, and you may need to, uh, to perform it in both, which again, will add time. So overall, AC testing much quicker, potentially with higher limits, which pose a safety aspect, in which case you may need to consider how you create a safe working environment. Now for safe working environments, uh, again, we have some uh, reading material on this. We'll provide you links to how to create safe working environments and where those, those levels of current uh, become a problem and, and where we do need to apply safe uh, working environments. And DC testing, much more accurate in terms of representat representation of true leakage, but testing times are typically uh, a fair bit slower than, than AC. So we mentioned throughout the, uh, the course of today that we have some um, test standards that we, we should refer to. This table here kind of refers to uh, a few of the more common uh, applications that we see within our uh, our product portfolio. So we have kind of lighting standard, household equipment, um, electrical equipment for measurement, control and laboratory use, which, which is effectively the standard that we manufacture uh, our test equipment to, and then production environment for AV and, and IT equipment. Now you can see for, for each of them, there is, a, there is a range of voltages at which the test is, is performed at, and it does specify both AC and DC in most circumstances. Now, the range between kind of if we take an example of um, the household, 400 to two and a half thousand volts, what will differ there will be whether it's class one, class two, class three, but also whether it's kind of double insulated or, or earthed. So typically in the household environment, 60335 for a class one uh, 240 volt product, we'd be testing at around a thousand volts for a class two 240 volt product we'd be testing at 2,500 volts if we were performing an AC uh, test. 
You can see some of the standards do offer a, a limit, a trip limit. So lighting, 5 milliamps, household equipment, 5, but can be raised to 30 milliamps. The others will say no breakdown. And in that case, you might want to apply the, the rule of thumb that we spoke about. Ramp time, not always specified um, and sometimes even specified for AC measurements. So you'll see the 61010, we have to raise the voltage to its uh, test voltage from zero within five seconds. And then we have a time at the end of that. And that time in seconds is our hold time. So that's how long we have to physically apply the voltage for whilst the voltage is its maximum capability. So again, that you'll see that ranges in this instance from one to, to four seconds as a maximum. Okay, well, I hope the presentation has given you a good kind of background into high pot testing. We're just gonna pause at this point and show you a couple of videos actually showing the test being performed in the real world on a number of different items. So we have a class one product, we have a, um, a class two product, uh, so hopefully you'll get an idea for, for how the test is performed and what a tester looks like once it's, uh, whilst it's performing the test. So we'll leave you to the, watch these and then we'll come back and I'll introduce you to our HAL products. In this first demonstration, we're going to test a simple resistive heating element. Now the element itself comprises of three main parts. There's the internal resistive core, there's an insulation level barrier, and then there's also the external metal and you'll see that internal insulation and then the external metal sheath so we're going to be testing the strength of the insulation between the resistive core and the, uh, the the metal sheath externally so firstly let's make our test connections well our output is going to be supplied on a clip and we're going to apply that as so and then what we're going to use is our dedicated probe to place onto the metal surface and this will then give us a, a measurement of the the leakage current so let's quickly talk about the test itself for this particular test we're going to apply a voltage of 1.5 kV we're going to perform that test for two seconds and we've set two limits we've set an upper limit for safety of 5 milliamps but we've also set a lower limit of 0.2 milliamps in this case now that's to hold any potential non-connections so if we forget to put the clip on we would expect to get no leakage but we know we should expect some so we've set a lower limit of 0.2 if for any reason it's below that the test will fail but hopefully the reading will come in between the upper and lower limits so let's attach our probe and perform the test And you can see the leakage was 0.49 milliamps, indicating a good test. So for this demonstration, we're going to show you how the outlet box can make connections simple and easy to use for operators within a production environment. So we have our test item, a, a simple iron, which is connected to the mains via a, a standard three pin plug. You'll notice then we have our output connection from the HAL. This has a typical, again, three pin socket. Now during testing what will happen is the live and neutral connectors will be linked together. The test voltage will be applied to the live and neutral conductors simultaneously. And then any fault current returning to the HAL will go via the earth cable of the appliance. So let's plug the unit in and perform the test. In this case we're going to be performing the test at 1000 volts. We're going to slowly ramp the voltage up over 5 seconds, hold the test for 5 seconds just to show you what's happening on screen. Typically this kind of test would be over within kind of a, a few seconds. So let's perform the test and show you what happens. You can see the voltage rising. Okay, so let's now start the test off. You'll notice we're performing the test at 1000 volts. We're gonna rise that voltage over five seconds. We're gonna hold it for five seconds, which is typically longer than a, a kind of normal production line, which may only take a couple of seconds to perform. We've got a limit of five milliamps, so providing the, the leakage is less than five milliamps, the test will pass. Let's go ahead and start the test and see what happens. You'll notice now the voltage is rising. We're getting some leakage, 
but nothing high. The test is now in its hold phase and at the end of the test the leakage is less than the 5 milliamps and therefore we receive a pass. So now we're going to be testing a double insulated or class 2 product. For this particular product we're going to be testing a, a jigsaw um, and the jigsaw is connected to the mains via a supply plug. So we're going to be using our output connection. Now, because this is double insulated, there is no earth connection to the device, so we have to supply an external connection to read any fault leakage current back into the device. And for this particular example, we're gonna be using our return probe. So firstly, we need to connect our plug into our output box. And you'll notice there are various points on the device with exposed metalwork. So it may be that we have to perform the test multiple times to ensure that any exposed conductive parts are, are checked to make sure the insulation is good. In terms of the test parameters themselves, because this is double insulated, we tend to test at a higher voltage, usually twice that of the, the class one variant. So in particular example today, we're gonna to be testing this at two and a half thousand volts. We're gonna be testing each point for one second and as providing the limit is less than five milliamps, then everything will be good. So let's go ahead and start with our first exposed metal point. We'll take our probe, place it onto the metal point, and then we can start the test. The test is good, so we can move to the next point. And finally, we'll do one more metal point. And in this instance, all points passed, and therefore the product is good. Well, I hope you found the videos interesting and a, and a good basis for, for how high pot testing is performed. The test that we used in the uh, in all of the videos is our, our HAL series of, of high pot testers. So these are multifunction testers. They employ high pot testing along with other functions such as earth bond uh, and kind of load and leakage measurements if you want to uh, to perform those. The ethos of the, the HAL tester is really that it is designed primarily for production line environments. So with that, we make it completely programmable. You can create test sequences uh, which flow in a certain order. So your operators will just simply enter some details about the product they're testing. That could be things such as serial numbers, for record keeping uh, capabilities. And then they'll follow a defined period of, of tests. So every test you want to perform with the order you want them performed, for the time you want them performed, with the limits you want them performed, will all be built into our test sequence builder. And what that really offers you as a, as a manufacturer is the kind of confidence that all of your tests are being performed exactly how you wanted them in a repeatable manner as, as quickly as possible. The unit itself does have a, an internal memory. So it will store the results, you can download them to a PC, and therefore you've got full traceability of every product that goes through your production line. You have that backup, that peace of mind that, that all of your products have been tested. The HAL also uses a, a number of um, optional accessories to, to increase the efficiency in the production environment. So that can be everything from barcode scanners to help you quickly enter things like serial numbers or comments or any other data that you want to, to put into the unit. We can also output labels. So if you wanted to prove that the unit's been tested, you could print a label off at the end of the test. And we also have things like software. So you've got instant um, transfer of results onto a network for absolute secure kind of storage. So we have four models in the range. Um, we start with our HAL 101, which is purely a high pop and insulation resistance tester. Uh, you'll notice it does it both at AC and DC voltages. Um, and they all have the, the kind of memory capability. As we then move up through the functions, we add the 103, which brings in earth bond testing. So if you do manufacture class one products and you do need to do an earth bond test as part of your routine production testing, then the, the HAL 103 is the good starting point. And then those of you that are really interested in kind of your quality output, making sure that the products are doing what they're designed to do. So not only performing the safety tests, but making sure they're operational and working exactly how expected. We can get into our 104 and our LED models. Now they will power the equipment up. They will do things like load tests, 
but also things like measurement of uh, earth and protective uh, current leakage and touch leakage. So you've got additional safety functions as well as kind of quality control measures to ensure that not only are your products going out the door safe, but also functioning as expected. Well, that brings me to the end of today's presentation. I really hope you found it useful. Uh, as I said, I am going to open the floor up now to any questions you may have. Please feel free to, to send them through the chat function or the, the question function as well. And I'll be here for, for a few minutes seeing what questions we come through and then kind of answering any live through the, the chat function. Thanks again for your attention. We will send out um, copies of this presentation. It will be recorded if you wanted to share it with colleagues. And we will send you all of the accompanying documentation that I mentioned. But at this point, again, I'd just like to thank you once more for coming and hope to see you on the next one.